Welcome everyone uh, to today's uh, training session coming to you from Sydney, Australia. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the uh, FAAC 950 N2 pedestrian auto door, uh, looking at some essential issues around that operator to ensure a trouble free operation. Uh, as always, you able to hear me, hopefully, um, but I can't hear you. You're all muted in the audience. So if there are any uh, questions along the way, maybe just type them into the chat box. If I do see them, I'll get to them. Otherwise, we will have some uh, Q&A time at the end of the session. So uh, for the next hour, you're going to have to put up with me. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, first thing we're going to do is look at our agenda today. Uh, we're going to just touch on the technical specifications of this operator. Look at a typical site layout identify some of the components, um, just touch on the mechanical installation, but spend a fair amount of time on the electronic installation. Look at the KP Evo controller, um, look at some intercom functionality, which is quite a nice uh, functionality offered by these uh, operators, uh, and then just touch on some maintenance followed by a question and answer session. So let's kick off uh, with technical specifications. Uh, the one I want to point out initially is just that this is a 100% duty rated operator. So this operator can run 24 seven, opening and closing all day, all night, no issues whatsoever. There are some restrictions on the uh, door weight and they tie into the uh, door width or the, uh, the leaf width. Uh, according to a table number five, which we'll find in the manual and which I'll, I'll pull up here, uh, we do have this table which, uh, which, which lists various door lengths or leaf lengths on the left hand side and along the top, the different type of drive arms that we can use with this operator being the articulated arm, which is typically used to push the door open, uh, or the shoe arm, which is used to pull the door open, depending on where we mount this, which side of the door we mount this operator. So um, if you look at an example, we go down to a door of uh, 1300 millimeters, so 1.3 meters wide, and we're gonna be pulling this door open with a standard shoe arm, we limit it to a maximum door mass of 83 kilograms. So the table's fairly straightforward to use, but it is important just to make sure before even you get to the sales point, that you've got the correct operator for the doors that you're trying to automate. Uh, there are some restrictions on the uh, door post depth, uh, the maximum door post depth, again, in, depending on how you install the operator, if it's on the architrave or on the door. Uh, and uh, that also ties in with the maximum opening angle that you can achieve. So we have another table. We look at it on the left hand side, the uh, different types of arm and mounting. So articulated shoe and whether it's architrave or the operator is architrave mounted or door mounted. Uh, and then we have the door post depth and the maximum opening angle. So as an example, um, just to look at the, what door post depth means, if you look at the top right, I have a graphic which shows you that highlighted dimension zero to 250, that's the depth, the maximum reliable depth of the door post. So you can see there's an offset here between the operator, which is mounted on that uh, uh, architrave and the actual mounting on the front of the door, the, the bracket mounting on the front of the door. That distance is what we refer to as a door post depth. So as an example, uh, for an architrave mounted articulated arm system, we can tolerate a door post depth of between zero and 250 millimeters and uh, get an, uh, achieve an opening angle between 100 and 125 degrees. Okay, so that's how we used uh, table number six, straightforward. Looking at a typical site layout, um, number one, we have a 240 volt supply. This is a 240 volt operator, so we need a power supply to power it. We will have some safety sensor or safety sensors, uh, some sort of devices mounted to the door, which are going to um, effectively protect pedestrians who are in the path of the moving door. There could be an opening sensor or sensors mounted above or to the side of the door. These are going to detect approaching pedestrians to uh, cause the door to open. Um, there might be a KP or LK Evo keypad or mode pad fitted to the system. There could be a key switch that enables or disables that keypad. And we could have any number of control devices, be it a free exit push button, a uh, card reader, building access control, remote controls, etc. Uh, that could be fitted. And then lastly, there, there potentially could be an electric lock fitted to the door. It's important to note that the 950 N2 is not self-locking. So um, it is possible at any time to push the door against the operator and actually move the door. Um, if you want that door secured in the closed position, you will need to fit an electric lock. And we'll touch on uh, that a little bit later in the presentation. So in terms of the identification of the components, we have the door operator itself, which is the 950 N2, the main operator. We have an aluminium cover that goes over that operator, uh, and then we have some hardware, which is either a shoe arm or a sliding arm. Once again, as I say, in most cases used uh, where, where you're pulling the door open. Uh, 
uh, and we have an articulated arm, uh, which is typically used to push the door open. For both of those arms, we offer two extensions, a, a, H, a 50 millimeter and an H80, 80 millimeter extension, and they fit onto the um, articulated or shoe arms in the, in, the, in the area of highlighted by the circle, and that allows the arm to be offset from the operator with the where basically there's a vertical offset between where you mount the operator and where we can actually fix the arm to the door. So those extensions are accessories. Then they are not, not always required, but just know if they are required, you can uh, you can get them. All right, so on the operator itself, uh, let's look at some of the key components. So firstly, we have a cable entry, obviously, for our 240 volts and uh, any control cables that we need to connect to the unit. There is a mains connector where we terminate our incoming 240 volts, and there's a dedicated earth connector on the metal chassis of the unit, which allows us to uh, basically bond the earth and ensure the unit is correctly earthed. There is a uh, I.O. board or an input output board, which is mounted on the one side of the operator, and then there's a logic board, which is mounted on the other side of the operator. They have two distinct functions, those, board, those boards, but just know that there are two boards. We then have a drive shaft. This is what drives the uh, the drive arm that operates the door, and that drive shaft is actually accessible from both sides of the operator. Uh, and the reason for that is the operator can actually be mounted either you know right way up or upside down, depending on whether it needs to be mounted to the left or the right of the door frame. So um, that's why we have access to the output shaft on both sides. And then lastly, we have some mechanical stops. So those are actual mechanical stops on the operator itself that define the fully open and the fully closed position of the door. And that's there in case the door itself doesn't have uh, end stops. In most cases, most doors will have a closing stop at the very least. They may have an opening stop or may not. If the stop is mechanical stop is missing on the site, you can utilize that internal stop to define the stopping point in open and or closed. Right, so in terms of mechanical uh, installation, we have three mounting options. Okay, um, as I note again here, turning the operator over allows left or right installation. So for all these three mounting options, you can mount the operator either to the left or the right of the door frame by simply inverting the operator. So the first option is uh, where the operator is architrave mounted with an articulated push arm. So as you can see from the diagram below, the door opens outwards when viewed from the operator side uh, and is driven by the articulated uh, arm. You can then have a door mounted operator. Okay. Once again, with the articulated push arm, but in this case, the operator is mounted on the door, as we said, and the uh, opening direction is actually inwards, as seen from the operator side. And then lastly, we have the Architrav mount with a standard arm, standard uh, shoe arm, and in that case, the door opens inwards, as seen from the operator side. So in those three cases, as I say, left or right orientation is achievable and so uh, fairly straightforward. When it comes time to actually mount that operator on the Architrav or the door, and um, there are very uh, detailed dimensional drawings within the manual itself, but it's much easier to use the uh, whole templates that are supplied with the transmission arm. So when you open that transmission arm box, you'll see inside there are some templates. You just choose the correct template for your installation, be it architrave or door mount and be it articulated or shoe arm. And you use that template, you, you align that template with the center line of the door hinge and basically that um, shows you where all the necessary mounting holes need to be. So you can mark those off and drill them and then fit the operator. When it does come time to fit the operator, I just want to point out in particular, if you're using the shoe arm, okay, before you mount the operator to the architrave, you need to fit that arm so that it's angled at 45 degrees outwards. So in other words, you fit the, 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 um, the, the shoe arm onto the output shaft angled 45 degrees outwards before fitting the operator to the architrave. And the reason for that is that you need to put some pretension into the closing spring on the operator. So as I said, the operator is not self-locking, but it does have an integral torsional um, closing spring. So it's like a door closer. So in the event of a power failure, the door will automatically close, but that spring needs to be pretensioned. And the only way to achieve that is to start off with the drive arm, um, at 45 degrees, um, basically, to the operator. So you pull that back, fix it to the door, and there's some preload on the spring. If you don't um, fit that drive on 45 degrees, you're going to be having to remove the operator from the architrave, which is a real nuisance. So just take, take note of that before fitting it to the wall. OK, so once we've fitted it to the wall, we just need to make sure that our internal stops, if required, are adjusted. So those are the two bolts that you can see there, um, highlighted by those arrows. So one is an opening stop, one is a closing stop. You may or may not need them. If you do need them, loosen them off. They are shipped from the factory in the um, 
in the basically the maximum rotation position. So you might have to reduce that rotation to suit your particular door, move it to the correct point, and then tighten them up again. And that will provide an internal end stop in both the opening and the closing uh, positions. Okay, so you've got the unit um, mechanically installed now. We need to just bring power to it. So the first thing is we, uh, we crimp the earth cable lug uh, to the earth wire. There is a cable lug provided in the kit. Crimp that to the earth wire and fasten it to the chassis of the operator. Uh, that gives us a good earth bonding to the unit. And then you can terminate your active and your neutral wires directly to the terminal, uh, to the power terminal. You secure your power cable using the cable grip, and then that's taking care of your uh, reticulation to the unit, giving it power. We're then going to focus on the, um, the first of the um, control boards, which you can see in that, uh, in that uh, drawing or in that photograph. It's the green board, which is the I.O. board or the inputs output inputs outputs board. If we have a look at that board layout, there's a whole lot of connectors and terminals, uh, which we're going to look at now. The first one, uh, connector one, J1, that's the transformer connector. There is a transformer that's built into the unit, which basically transforms the incoming 240 to a lower voltage to use by the unit. That's plugged into J1. Uh, we have J2. J2 is a connector for the side function selector. So on the aluminium cover that, that fits over the operator, there's a little door on the side. We're highlighting on the bottom right there in that circle. There's a little door that opens, and behind that door, there's a three-position rocker switch. The central position is a neutral position. It doesn't do anything. That's normal operation. But you can flick that switch to position one or position two. Generally, position one by default is programmed to hold the door fully open. And position two, uh, I think the default is, uh, not, is uh, a manual mode, but it can also be uh, programmed um, to, to night mode or any other mode using the KP EVA. Uh, but that little selector switch is plugged into the IO board on J2. Uh, if you don't plug it in, you won't be able to use the functionality of that switch. Uh, J3 is the KP EVO connector, so that's a four wire connected to your either your KP EVO mode pad or your LK uh, EVO um, uh, mode pad. We have uh, J4, which is our inputs terminal. So these are the various inputs to the board, uh, we'll, and we'll go into that in a little bit detail in the next slide. Um, J5 is your uh, door and lock status, so that's uh, connectors for your door lock and the door status. Um, J6 are general purpose outputs. J7 is a five pin connector for the FAAC five pin radio receivers. Either the RC or the uh, SLH receiver can be, can be plugged into that J7 if radio control is required. There is J8, which is our intercom bus terminal board. So that's for interconnecting multiple operators. And we'll talk about that later. Um, J10 is a power supply to your logic board, which is the second electronic board we'll touch on. Uh, J11 is the main connector to that logic board. And then lastly, F2 is a power supply fuse. So if the system isn't powering up for any reason, you can check that, make sure that that fuse is intact. Um, furthermore, on the IO board, we have some dip switches. Uh, DS2 in particular is important. It is um, used for intercom functionality, and we'll touch on that again when we get to the intercom functionality. You've got SW1, which is a little push button, which is used for resetting the board, but also for the setup of the system. Uh, again, we'll touch on that later. There's a DL1 is your accessories power supply LED. That tells us that we've got power going to our accessories. And lastly, um, DL2 through 9 are just indicators or diagnostic indicators for the various inputs on the board. And we'll touch on those um, in the next slide. So let's look at the various inputs along J4. Well, firstly, we have a 24 volt auxiliary power supply. Please note the restriction on that power supply maximum one amp supply at 24 volts DC. There are four common terminals or negative terminals. You can never have enough of those. So it's really great that they got four of them for all your incoming signals. Then we have I1 by default is an internal open uh, trigger. So that would be on a typically on a um, approach sensor on the inside of the door. Uh, there's I2, which is an external open, which would then be a, an approach sensor on the outside of the door. Those are both normally open. And then we've got a couple of normally closed inputs. So there's an emergency close, a closing safety, and an opening safety device. So note those are normally closed. If they're not used, then you need to link them out on this terminal block. You need to link them out to negative. So what are they? Well, emergency close is just an input which will automatically ensure that the doors are closed, regardless of the operating mode. They will close those doors and hold them closed as long as that input is active. And then opening and closing safety devices, they're self-explanatory. Those are devices which will detect the presence of the pedestrian in the doorway and reverse or stop the door accordingly. 
Uh, some more normally open inputs. Input six is a key input, so that will always activate the door regardless of whether it's in night mode or not. Input seven is a fire alarm. In the fire alarm case, if a fire alarm is active, the doors will always close with the locks deactivated. So the doors will be closed, but if you push them, you'll be able to get through them. And then lastly, input eight is uh, automatic open. So that's just a general purpose trigger to open the door and it'll automatically close on its pause timer. So those are the defaults. If you want to change those defaults, you can, but for that, you will need the KP Evo programmer. Um, on the J5, which is the board outputs, uh, as mentioned, we've got outputs dedicated to controlling a lock. We have both the common normally open and normally closed contacts. We'll talk about the lock a little bit later. And then we have another um, set of contacts which indicate the door status, whether the door's open or closed. Quite useful to send back to a building automation system or an alarm system. Okay, so moving to the second, uh, the second board or the second electronic board on the uh, N950 N2 is the logic board that's mounted on the opposite side to the IO board next to the motor. And if you look out on the layout of that logic board, um, we have a USB port, so that supports the plugging in of a USB flash drive, which is typically used for firmware updates, uh, but can also be used to save parameters that were on the board and uh, restore parameters on the board, etc. There's a uh, connector which goes back to the I.O. board. There's a motor connector to which your motor on the unit plugs in. There's a jumper J6, which is used to select the spring closing speed. So as I mentioned, this unit does have a, uh, a built-in torsion spring, which closes the door in the event of a power failure. The speed at which the door closes can either be fixed to absolute minimum speed, uh, or it can actually be controlled by a trim pot. And uh, the selection between those two functions is done on this J6 jumper. Depending on its position, the door either is controlled by the trim pot or, con or, or closes at minimum speed. J7 is your power supply connector from the IO board, providing power to the uh, logic board. Switch one is just a push button on the logic board, which is used for programming purposes internally to the parameters on the board. It's not used for setting up the door. It's just simply a kind of a programming button where if we make any changes to the settings on this logic board, they're stored within the logic board by pressing that uh, SW1. SW2 switch uh, dip switches is a bank of 10 dip switches, which we'll go into in detail in the next slide. They're used for basically programming the functions on the board if you don't have a KPE Evo programmer. And then we've got uh, trim pot one, which sets the opening speed, two sets the closing speed, three sets the pause adjustment or the pause time on the unit. And then uh, trim pot four sets the closing speed if you've selected that option. And then lastly, there is a battery holder for a, a 1216 lithium coin cell if you're going to be wanting to back up the onboard clock if you're using the onboard timer functionality. Again, only accessible via the KP EVA. So uh, some diagnostics on this uh, on this logic board. We've got a green uh, LED which shows if a, a USB stick has been plugged in and recognized, that'll be on. There's a red LED which uh, which indicates the setup is taking place. Uh, it also indicates errors if that's on. There's, there's some error on the board. DL3 is a blue LED just showing that there is power on the logic board. And then lastly, the yellow LED DL4. That indicates whether there's a mismatch between the parameters stored in the board and the parameters set on the trim pots and dip switches. So as you make changes on those trim pots and dip switches, that yellow LED lights up to say you've made changes, but they're not actually stored on the board yet. You have to briefly press that switch SW1 in order to lock in the changes that you've made. So that's the purpose of the yellow LED. So looking in a bit more depth at the 10-way dip switch, okay, the very first dip switch, number one, is for setting anti-intrusion, the anti-intrusion function. By default, that'll be off. What anti-intrusion is, is basically if somebody tries to push on the door and it's not, it doesn't have an electric lock fitted, you're going to move the door, but the door's then going to start pushing back at you. And uh, where it's quite useful is if this is on an external door, which is maybe subject to pressure differences due to air conditioners or gusts of wind, if you turn that function on, if there's a gust of wind or a pressure difference which tends to want to pull the door open, the uh, operator will actually push it back closed again. Dip switch number two, which I've highlighted in green because it's the one dip switch which you have to uh, pay attention to on your installation, this selects the type of transmission arm. So if it's by default off, it'll be an articulated arm uh, which uh, basically pushes the door to activate it. Uh, if, it's, uh, if, if you're using a shoe arm or a slide arm, you need to set that dip switch to on. So that is the one dip switch that you need to pay attention to on your installation. Um, dip switch number three changes the function of the uh, selector, external selector switch, the position two. Uh, by default, it's manual mode. You can change that to night mode with dip switch three. 
Tip switches four and six set up push and go functionality. So push and go functionality is basically where somebody approaches the door, they actually open the door as if they would, as if they were going to walk through it. So they push it. The uh, the operator detects that it's being pushed and swings open automatically and then closes on auto close. So there's a couple of settings for push and go. Um, one of them is uh, your standard setting, which is as works as described. As I say, as you push the door, it automatically uh, takes over and starts to open and then automatically closes. Uh, and the other setting is what they call fast food mode. And in that mode, you actually push the door open manually, but then it closes uh, automatically under motor power. Um, dip switch five is not used. Dip switch seven, that just sets up the uh, safety sensor. If you're using a specific safety sensor on the opening side of the door, that as the door opens is detecting the presence of the wall and thinking that it's actually a person, you can turn on uh, dip switch seven, and that basically ignores that opening safety sensor when the door's in close proximity to the opening stop. Typically, you're not going to use that function if you use our flat scan sensors, which we'll look at later. Uh, dip switch eight is selectable close power. So this gives the door a kind of a positive close mode. So as the door swings closed, when it gets close to that closed point, it actually pushes at maximum power. And that's quite useful where you have to drive the door into a lock or there's, a, there's tight seals around the door or high friction at that closing point. It just gives that additional force to the door to ensure it's fully closed. And then lastly, dip switch nine is uh, used for um, testing the safety devices. So it's a test function for the safety devices. Generally, we leave that off until we've got everything fitted and then we might turn it on at a later stage. Uh, dip switch 10 is not used, so we don't have to consider that one. So as I say again, in general, when you start up, all these dip switches will be off. The only one you really want to pay attention to initially is dip switch 2 to select the correct uh, transmission arm. Then get your door set up, get it all configured, and then start playing um, with changing functionality on the dip switches just to reduce the complication on the initial install. Uh, so just to go back again to the trimmers on the logic board, there is a trimmer which adjusts opening speed. There's one that adjusts closing speed. Um, there's one that adjusts the pause time. So these are the three basic parameters that you're going to might want to set up on the door. And then lastly, the TR4 trimmer for uh, regulates the closing uh, spring, the closing speed of the door in the event of a power failure. So it's important to note that if the yellow LED is lit, it means you've made changes to either the trim pots or the dip switches, which have not yet been stored on the board. So please just again, pay attention to the fact that any change you make to the trim pot for speed or to the dip switches for functionality must be followed by a brief press of uh, switch one, SW1. That will lock those settings into the board. The yellow LED will go off and the function you've changed will then be implemented. So if you're changing the speed and the door doesn't seem to be changing speed, it's because you, you'll see that yellow LED is on and you haven't locked the changes into the logic board. Okay, so let's look at the initial setup. We've obviously um, made sure before starting that the door moves smoothly and without any friction. Always important with any automation, the door or the gate must move smoothly. So make sure there's no, no unnecessary friction. If there are any closing devices that have been fitted to the door, you know, uh, springs or internal torsion springs, get rid of all of them. The door must be free to move open, free to move closed. So start off by basically installing your automation, closing the door, you turn the power on to the unit, you check the status LEDs are correct, so all your inputs, your normally closed inputs have been bridged, the correct lights are on. Do any programming perhaps you want to do, and, and typically, like I say, I suggest at the very least, you must set up the type of door arm, whether it's a, a shoe or articulated. You're then going to carry out a setup procedure, which is going to set up the limits on the door, and then you'll carry out the final operations, make the connections of all your safety devices, etc. Okay. You need to do the setup procedure of the door limits. Uh, whenever the automation is first put into operation, that's an obvious one. If you ever change the logic board or replace the logic board, you'd have to reset the limits. Um, if there are any changes to the door, so the maximum opening angle changes, the weight of the door changes, there's uh, changes in the friction, you'll have to reset up. And at any time, if you factory default of the unit, you'll also need to reset the limits. So the setup procedure or the limit setup procedure mustn't be carried out in the, if there's an emergency active, if there's a fire alarm active, if the door's in manual mode or night mode or, or, or door open mode. In any of those modes, you won't be able to actually set up the door. So it is important. And it's also important to note that during setup, the door is going to go through some automatic movements. The safety detectors are ignored. So if anyone's in the way or anything's in the way, it's going to be hit by the door. Make sure the area is clear before you do the uh, limit setup. So <clears throat> you need to have both opening and closing mechanical stops present in order to do the setup. And just note that the red error or the red setup LED of the logic board will flash quickly for the entire duration of the setup procedure. So to start the setup, 
from the uh, logic board, what we do is we press and hold the push button on that on that on the I/O board for at least five seconds. So important to note here: there's push buttons on both the I/O board and the logic board. Although the logic board is the brains of the operation, the setup is actually done from the push button on the I/O board, not the push button on the logic board. Don't get the two mixed up. So to run your setup, identify switch one on your I/O board, press and hold it for at least five seconds, and then release it. And what will happen is the red LED on the logic board will start to flash rapidly. And the door will um, start doing a series of movements. OK, so the doors was in the closed position. You'll see it trying to close more. You'll see it opening a little. It'll be moving a little bit open, moving fully open, moving to and fro. And what it's doing is it's actually measuring the force required to move the door, the speed, deceleration values for opening and closing. And it sort of like tunes itself uh, for the particular door. And it will always end up if it's successful in the closed position and the setup LED, the red LED will be off. That's an indication that the door has been successfully set up. If you end up at the end of setup with your door in the open position, the most likely cause of that is that you've selected the incorrect arm type. That instead of a push type, you've got a pull type. So instead of articulated, you specified shoe, or instead of shoe, you specified articulated. So if the setup completes successfully, but the door's fully open instead of fully closed, everything's back to front. You need to go and change that dip switch, which selects the arm type. Rerun your setup, and everything should come back to normal. So we now assume that the door's mechanically set up, um, electrically set up, uh, the limits are learnt, and the next thing we need to do is look at our safety sensors that we're going to fit to the door. So there's always a recommendation to fit safety sensors to the door to stop the door from hitting a pedestrian as they walk through in either the opening or the closing direction. And typically for that, we use these sensors uh, shown on the screen here, which is the uh, LZR flat scan safety sensor, a really nice sensor. That sensor fits up in the corner of the door, as you can see it here. And basically what happens is it creates a curtain of light, which is shown by those, uh, those red areas on the two doors there, creates a curtain of light, which if uh, there's an obstruction detected in that curtain, actually causes the door, if it's closing, to stop and reopen, or if the door is opening, it'll just stop the door, prevent the door from hitting somebody. It's important to note that those sensors, you can see on the, there's one mounted on the left door, one mounted on the right door. They are available in both left and right-handed orientation, and they're also available in a kit of a with a left and a right. Uh, and what is important to, to note with these sensors is that if you're mounting two sensors on the same door, so one for opening safety, one for closing safety, on the same door, they can be operated in a master-slave configuration, and we'll talk about that now. So the sensor itself has a series of connectors, a series of connection wires. There's obviously power supply to it. There's a relay contact which provides um, uh, safety on the opening side of the door. And there's a relay contact that provides uh, safety on the closing side of the door. And then there's also a test input to the sensor, which allows the control board to ensure the sensor is working before the door operates, which may or may not be a requirement. What's important, I did mention that if you have sensors on both the inside and the outside of the same door leaf, they operate in a master slave configuration. So you actually only wire these colored connections to the master sensor, but between the master and slave sensor, there's a little cable that comes in the kit, which you use to join the master to the slave. There is no wiring actually made to the slave sensor other than the little interconnection cable. And then everything is basically wired from the master back to your control board. Uh, so it's really, really simple to achieve the uh, the two sensors, one inside and one outside. OK, so the only thing to note is that if you are using internal and external sensors, or in fact, even if you're using single sensors, there is a dip switch on each of the sensors. Um, there's a series of four dip switches, in fact. The first dip switch is the important one because that sets whether the or tells the system whether the sensor is on the opening side of the door or the closing side of the door and activates the appropriate relay uh, depending. So if you are mounting the sensor, um, you need to be cognizant of which side of the door you're mounting on and set that dip switch, dip switch number one, to the appropriate position for either um, opening or closing safety. Once you've uh, made the connections uh, between the two sensors, if, you, if you're using two, uh, or if you've only got a single sensor, you will then need to wire that into the, uh, the I.O. board. And that's as per the drawing shown on the right hand side. It's quite clearly highlighted in the manual, the color of the wires and what terminals they go to on the control board. If you've only got a closing sensor or closing safety device, you obviously don't wire the opening safety device in and vice versa. Um, and if you want to run the beam test, you need to terminate the red and blue wires into terminals 24 and 25 of J6 as, as shown. 
So that's the electrical connection of the uh, flat scan. Now we need to actually program the flat scan so that flat scan recognizes the door area that needs to be protected. The flat scan works on a principle called time of flight. So what it actually does is it has a laser scanner which sends out a laser beam, scans a laser beam out, and looks at reflections of that beam at various points along the door and basically measures the distance of the object that that beam is reflected from. And if it's within the operating range of the door, it will give you an error signal. And if it's outside, it won't give you a signal. So we need to actually set up the scanner to say this is the width of door that you need to scan. And that's basically done by doing what we call a teach-in. So in order to do a teach-in, and I'm going to show you a video um, shortly in the next slide, which will highlight um, physically uh, how you do the teaching, but just suffice it to know that the door needs to be closed when you start the teaching. Uh, you need to make sure that both the relays of the sensors are connected to the door controller, uh, and you've got the master-slave connection between the two modules, if you're using two modules, that there's nothing in the way of, uh, of the doors, obviously, and uh, that the little protection um, cover on the, on the laser window has been removed. Uh, it's, it's shipped with a little cover, you need to take that off. So you launch the teaching by, by pressing a button on the on the unit very briefly. Um, you wait uh, until the sensors flash green. You you use your hand to demarcate the edge of the door, uh, and then basically the door goes through, or, or the sensors go through a process. So I'm going to show you a, a video which is going to highlight all of those words in uh, in some pictures, which, as you know, are worth a thousand words. So take a look at the video, and you'll see how simple it is to actually teach in the sensor. Before launching a T-Gen, activate the service mode on the master module. Be aware that during the service mode, the safety of the door is deactivated. The service mode can be activated by pressing the push button for more than three seconds. It enables the door to close in order to launch a T-Gen. The sensor is in service mode when the LED is off. Make sure the field is cleared before launching the T-Gen. To launch a T-Gen, Press the push button of the master module briefly. When installing a flat scan SW on a double swing door, repeat this on the second master module. The LED starts to flash red green quickly. Wait until both sensors flash green. Position yourself in front of the door and stretch out your arm in front of you. Make an up and down movement at closing edge level in order to mark the limit of the detection zones. The LED flashes red while calculating the width of the door wings. When the sensor flashes green again, activate a door opening so the sensor can learn its environment. Make sure you are outside of the detection field. During the closing of the door, the sensor flashes red. Once the door is completely closed again and the LED is off, the teaching is completed. So as you can see, that was the process of actually teaching in those sensors and defining the, uh, the area of the door that needs to be protected. Once that's been done, you can then check the correct positioning of those safety fields by placing an object in the detection field, making sure that the door stops without hitting the object. And if you need to, you can make adjustments to that protection uh, curtain, so to speak, you can adjust the angle of the laser curtain between uh, 2 and 10 degrees uh, using an adjustment screw on the unit. So if you do need to, you can move that uh, window or that curtain further away from the door, which obviously provides um, you know, safety earlier in the door cycle. Um, but if you do change that angle, please note you have to do another teach in after that to just test and correct the positioning of those detector fields. So that's the uh, the LZR flat scan, which provides that uh, safety on the doors. We're going to now look at the lock connections. The uh, there is a dedicated output for the lock on this board, as we mentioned, and it can the, the lock can either be um, wired in as powered to unlock, which is typical of a solenoid strike lock, uh, normally open contact, or it can be powered to lock, which is typical of a magnetic switch, which uses the normally closed contact or magne magnetic lock rather. Uh, just note, please, that the limitation on that lock is uh, 24 volts DC, a maximum of 500 milliamps. So although um, the, the, ex the accessory power supply on the board can supply up to an amp, the lock is limited to 500 milliamps. If you do have a lock that requires more than that, 
you're going to need to use your own external uh, relay and power supply to switch that lock. All right, so in terms of accessories, the most commonly used accessory is the KP Evo. That's the, uh, the programming um, keypad for the uh, 950N2. It looks very similar to the SDK Evo that you may have seen, which is used on A1400, a sliding auto door, but it's a different product. So don't try and uh, use the one in place of the other. The KP Evo is clearly marked KP Evo because it is different. And this KP Evo does allow you to select operating modes of the automation, but it also more importantly allows you to program a lot of the additional features that are not accessible without using this, uh, this keypad. Um, so the first thing we do is we're going to mount that uh, this keypad if we're going to leave it on site. Uh, in many cases, uh, an installer may actually just keep one of these keypads handy with them for programming purposes and then not leave it on the site. But if you are going to be leaving it on the site, you basically open the keypad up by removing two screws. You uh, break the two parts, uh, the, separate the two parts of the enclosure, um, remove or knock out the uh, cable knockout at the back of the base mounted to the wall using the fastening uh, your own fastening screws appropriate to whatever you're fastening it to. And then uh, basically we need to now look at the, the wiring of the KP Evo back to the 950N2. So on the KP Evo, there's a six-way terminal block. We're interested in four of those terminals, the V, the RX, the TX, and the G, and they are wired to the 950N2 terminal connector in a one-to-one -one fashion, V to V, RX to RX, TX to TX, and G to G. Uh, maximum cable length between the units, 50 meters, and we recommend the use of a shielded uh, UTP cable, a Cat5 cable for that connection. There is also an allowance on the KP EVA for an external key switch or, or normally closed switch uh, that, is, that is or can be used to disable the keypad if required. Very few people have used this, but the functionality is there if you're wondering what those connections are for. Once you've done the wiring, you basically just reassemble everything together, put the parts back together, fix it in place with the two screws, fasten the display using the, the screw shown and uh, insert the screw cover, and you're good to go. Most important, please note, when wiring this keypad, make sure there's no power on the system. I think it goes without saying that if you are doing wiring to a system, there shouldn't be power present. But just to reiterate, all the power is off when you're making these connections. Now that you've made all your connections, you can flick your power back on again, the keypad will come to life and you will see a dis uh, on the display a uh, bit of information. You'll see the product name, the, uh, the day and the date, or any errors. If there's a, an error on the system, you'll also see the time shown uh, on the central display. Um, if there are any warnings, you'll see a little warning bell top left that they're telling you that there are some warnings. If the onboard timer is active, there'll be a T indicated on the top left of the display. If the keypad is locked, there'll be a lock indicated. And then there's four buttons at the bottom of the keypad. The first one is used to uh, manually uh, or, or rather set or deselect um, night mode. The second one to set or deselect manual mode. The third button, which is a spanner, uh, is used for programming. And we'll talk about that in, in more detail uh, shortly. And then the last button, which is the right arrow, takes us to the selection menu and changes the screen to allow us to select different operating modes. So once we've changed to the selection screen, we can then uh, on the first button change between automatic opening and always open. On the second button, we can select between bi-directional operation, uh, exit only or entry only. And on the third button, we can switch between total opening or partial opening of the door. And then lastly, the fourth button obviously confirms that uh, mode of operation, takes us back to the home screen. So <clears throat> in terms of um, the programming of the unit, as I said, the third, the third button, which is the spanner icon, takes us basically to a, a programming screen. The first thing we need to do is enter a password. Uh, the default password is always 0000, zero, zero, zero um, unless it's been changed. I don't think I've seen anyone ever change it, but it can be changed if you want to prevent unauthorized access to the programming of the system. But once you've entered the uh, four zeros, you will then uh, see a list of menu items. And we're going to now go into that list and have a look at the menu items that are available if you're using the KP Evo keypad. So very first up, we have the language selection. Uh, because the product's manufactured in Italy, the default language will be Italian. So you'll probably want to go in, in, in Australia and change that to English uh, as the very first thing you do. The second menu item is the general programming, and there's a lot, a lot of submenus within here. So firstly, you can set uh, all of your inputs and your outputs. You can reconfigure them to have different functionality to the default. Um, you can also set whether they normally open or normally closed, and you can uh, also set if they're safety inputs, whether there's the testing is in enabled or disabled on those safeties. 
you have full control over the motion of the door, so the speed of the door, slow down, the push force, uh, acceleration and deceleration, the uh, automatic closing timing on the door, uh, some more advanced configuration of the lock if it's used. You can also, uh, on, in terms of installation submenu, you can actually select the. We can select the arm type. You can actually set up push and go. You can you can initiate a limit setup on the door, turn on uh, selective close power, etc. You can also set up intercom functionality, which we'll talk about in a little while. Um, and then there's a miscellaneous menu where you can uh, you can basically look at um, uh, you know whether you want to activate intrusion, uh, whether there's testing errors whether you, you want to set up the different con, con, uh, consecutive obstruction counters, um, change the, the, the passwords, et cetera. The errors menu shows you any errors. It gives you a verbose indication or wordy indication of any errors that might be present and what those errors are. There's a screen that shows you warnings, if there are any warnings. So these are very useful diagnostic tools. There's a screen which shows you cycle counters. So that gives you the cycle counts, how many cycles this door's done, which is quite useful from a, a maintenance perspective. Um, you can set date and time if you're going to be using the onboard timer. You can set up the onboard timer. Um, so you can set the door, you know, the, the operating mode of the door uh, based on time. Um, it's, a, it's a seven day timer, so you've obviously got uh, Monday through Sunday. And you can also set up holiday periods during which the functionality is perhaps uh, inhibited. You can go ahead and change your passwords uh, on the unit uh, and then just get some general information uh, on the uh, firmware versions on the door and the KP EVO. So that's the uh, wide range or wide array of functionality that's available through that KP EVO. So just to recap, um, programmable and visible only from the KP EVO are the input and output contact logic and additional functionality on the inputs and outputs, the external selector options, uh, timer functionality, the intercom modes, if you're going to use intercom, uh, anti-intrusion, if you want to use that, that's where someone pushes the door, the door tries to push back, um, advanced lock options, if you want anything beyond the basic lock operation, uh, you can see all your warnings and errors, and then obviously your cycle and maintenance counters. And then lastly, there are some IO diagnostics, uh, which are quite useful, which are available through the KP EVO. You can pull up a screen which shows the uh, the states of all your inputs and outputs, similar to the LEDs on the uh, IO board, but this shows it to you on the screen. Um, basically, the, the input is blacked out. As you see, input one is currently active, it shows that it's black grayed out. The others are inactive. And then you can also see the automation status, what the state of the door is. Uh, you can put up a screen that shows you that. So that's quite quite useful um, functionality in addition uh, using the KP EVO. All right, so we said we were going to talk about intercom functionality. So let's touch on that briefly. So what, what is intercom functionality? Basically, the 950N2 is capable of communicating with other 950N2s. So these door operators can actually talk to each other in a network um, using this intercom network connection. And what, what that allows us to do is we can, we can, A, we can select what we call intermode functionality. And what intermode is, is where you have a number of doors at a location, let's just say in an office, and you want to control the mode of those doors from one keypad or one mode pad. So you set up a mode pad at your master door and you select all your other doors as slave doors. You interconnect, you set up, and now you can change the operating mode of all the doors from one keypad at that master door. So you want all your doors to go into night mode. You just press night mode on your master door KP EVO. All the doors go into night mode. Um, and then when you come in, in the morning, you put them back into normal operating mode. So that's quite a useful way of distributing the mode across all the doors. You then have interlock for two single doors, and that's to create an airlock, where basically you say, that you need to enter the area through door one and door one has to close before you can activate door two. So it creates this high security entry. We have two leaves, which basically just allows a left and a right hand leaf to be synchronized as a double door. And then we lastly have two leaves with interlock, which is obviously the synchronized double door, but two sets of them with the airlock between. We're gonna really only look at the two leaves today because that's the one that's most commonly used. Uh, and how we synchronize a left and a right hand leaf using the intercom mode. So the first thing we need to do is when when we when we're setting up two leaves in the intercom, my first suggestion is set up each door totally independently. So forget that there's a second door. Set each door up as a single door, including your safety devices, and um, just make sure that the motion parameters for the two doors are the same. So the opening, closing speeds, et cetera, are identical so that they work together in a in, in a in a seamless way. Um, but like I say, treat each door individually at first. Set them up independently and make sure that they're all functioning correctly, their safety devices are working, 
uh, etc. Get that all done as a first step. Secondly, we then link the two um, the two I/O boards together using a three core cable, which will ideally be a shielded Cat5 cable. Um, there are connectors J8 on each of those uh, I/O boards marked G, CH, and CL. Basically, a one-to-one -one connection between each of those three-wire connection. And then, lastly, ensure that the dip switches on each of those uh, two 950N2s, dip switch two, both dip switches one and two are both on on both boards. So one and two on on the first 950N2, one and two on on the second 950N2. Those dip switches are end of line termination. And because there's only two um, doors in this network, both of one is at the one end of the line, the other one is the other end of the line. So make sure that those dip switches are on on both of the boards. So then what we do is we consider the door that has to open first as the master operator or the master door. So we call that one the master door. In some cases, there might not be a requirement to open one door before the other. So in the case that there's a lock fitted or there's, a, there's an edge or a, or a tab on the door, that one door might have to open first, in which case treat it as the master. If it doesn't matter which door opens initially or both doors can open at the same time, then don't worry about which one is the master. But if there, one is, if there is a door that has to open before, then you need to call that the master operator. You'll plug the KP Evo into the slave operator now. Power off on the operator, please note. Power off, plug the KP Evo in, wire it in, and power up the slave operator. Navigate through the menus to the intercom menu, menu six, okay? Select on menu 6.1, select the function to be two leaves. And on um, menu 6.2, select master slave number to two slave. That's all you need to set up on the slave unit. You can then basically exit your programming. You can power down, remove the, uh, the KP Evo. Go now to your master operator, also not powered, wiring your KP Evo, power up, and in programming, go again to the intercom menu on the master unit, select 6.1, the uh, function has two leaves. <clears throat> Under 6.2, select the master slave number as one master, and now go to option three, which is intercom registration and select yes. And what that'll do is it'll actually set up communication now between the master and the slave door or between the two doors. Okay. And once that's completed, <clears throat> go to option four, which is node list. And if you look in node list and everything's correctly registered, you should see zero two, which tells us that the master controller, network controller knows that there are two devices connected. If you've got zero two, everything's been set up correctly. If you haven't got 02, you've done something wrong, go back and try and troubleshoot what that is. Once you've confirmed that the, the network is set up correctly, you can then, if required, go into the installation menu five to menu item five, which is leaf delay, and you can set up whatever the required leaf delay is between the master and the slave door uh, opening. So basically we said, if you do require your master door to open first, here you can set up how many degrees the master door opens before the slave, the slave door starts to open, and similarly on closing. So you can set an appropriate leaf delay if required between zero and 90 degrees. Uh, and then once you've done that, effectively your intercom is set up and your door is uh, ready to, uh, to operate. It is important to note though, once we set up a master slave to leaf, all your activation signals go through the master operator. There's nothing, nothing additional connected to the slave operator. All the slave operator has is its safety devices connected to it and it's uh, three wires uh, intercom connection. All activation signals connected to the master operator because it's the master operator that is telling the slave operator when it must open and when it must close. So important to note, all activation signals to your master operator. All right, so that's intercom functionality. Hopefully that made sense to everybody. The last thing we're gonna look at is just um, scheduled maintenance on these doors. So every six months, we basically wanna go in, we wanna check that the smooth operation of the door leaves. We want to check that the opening and closing speeds are correct, that the safety system is working correctly, that if the lock, if it's fitted, is working correctly. And um, then every 12 months, we want, to, we want to basically just check around the frame structure of the door for any damage, uh, check the door frame, um, tighten any fasteners if they're required, check the door leaf itself, the hinges and the lock, lubricate if necessary, check the casing and the covers of the operator, tightening any fasteners that are required, and also check the condition of the the cables, the power, the sensor, the lock and accessory cables, make sure they're all okay. Check the operation of the sensors uh, when the door's operating, make sure that they are stopping the door where they're supposed to and any other control devices. 
check that the door operator correct, operates correctly in all the operating modes. So go through all the operating modes, um, you know, if, if they're being used and make sure that everything operates correctly. And then lastly, just check for the presence of any necessary warning labels. So if there are warning labels, for to just make sure they are there and they're still in place and they are visible. So that pretty much takes care of the maintenance. As you can see, not too much maintenance to be done, but uh, that is what you should pretty much be doing on a six and 12 monthly basis. So that brings us to the end of the, um, the session. Um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna quickly unmute everybody out there. Um, if there are any questions, now will be your opportunity. So you're unmuted and I can hear you out there. So I'm not sure if anyone has any questions, but now would be a good time to fire away. Okay, so all I hear are crickets on this side, guys. Any, any questions? No, okay, so it looks like everyone's basically remuted themselves. So I'll assume there are no questions to be asked. Uh, so thanks for joining me today. Hopefully there was something that you learned, even if you take one little nugget of information out of it, it was probably worthwhile. Uh, this session has been recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. So if you do want to look at it at your leisure or you want to show it to anyone else, uh, just please click through to YouTube and do a search on FAAC Australia and you'll find our channel and all our training videos. But in the meanwhile, thanks very much for your attendance. I do appreciate your time and have yourselves a good day. Thank you.